For this latest edition of Actually Someone Else Explores, I'm on the roof of one of the most iconic buildings in the world. I'm here to find out how the team at the O2 Arena have kept this facility state of the art. So the O2 Arena opened in June 2007 and had a huge impact on the, on the global live entertainment industry. Uh, how, um, how busy has the arena been in recent years? Obviously it had a massive impact then. Is this still one of the busiest arenas in the world? Yeah, so we're actually very proud of uh, the record that we've, we've held pretty much since we opened. You know, the O2 Arena is the busiest arena in the world. You know, last year we sold over two and a half million tickets. Wow. The next nearest was MSG in New York sold just under two million so you know we are the, the we are the leading arena in the world when it comes to you know ticket sales you know we we consistently do over 210 215 uh, events you know and that's been really the kind of the par number for the last four or five years obviously other than you know the pandemic years so yeah incredible track record in terms of the the full capacity can you just talk us through what that is and then also what the flexibility is in terms of different shapes and sizes of shows that this building can accommodate yeah, no, I mean, incredibly flexible. So it kind of ranges from, you know, circa 15,000 for a seated show uh, up to 22,500 for standing in the round. It was actually the Metallica show a few years ago. It still holds our record, which was just over 22,500. So incredibly flexible. Um, you know, we can do everything from, you know, eye shows to, you know, bigger rock concerts to bigger award shows like the Brits uh, a couple of weeks ago, Strictly Come Dancing, you know, and actually all of these shows we've done in the last few weeks. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it always amazes me that, you know, a show can roll in at 6 in the morning, can be out by 3 a.m., and then the following day we're building again at 6 a.m., you know, night after night after night, you know. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's what we've got here at the O2. Yeah, that's great to hear. I mean, obviously, it's, when you come here, you see the O2 and it's the big, big venue, but, you know, you utilise not just the big arena space. You obviously have the Indigo and various other... Um, spaces and, and facilities around under this under this dome. So, what ways do you kind of work to create cross-campus events here? See, this weekend we had C2C, which is the massive kind of country music festival that's been at the O2 for many years now. You know, it's a three-day festival, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And what's pretty unique about that event, and we started to do it on many other events as well, is we do have the opportunity to kind of interact and activate right across the site. So, you know, if you like, the arena is the main stage. But Indigo, you know, we had programming, we had programming in Blue Room, you know, we had programming up, up in the outlet, you know, right away across the site, we had an outdoor stage on Peninsula Square. So, you know, we're pretty, pretty unique in that way that we have this sort of footprint that we can play with. You know, artists can, you know, take over our story wall. We've got digital media network right around the site and we can give loads of opportunities for the artists to kind of engage with their fans, you know, and that's, that's pretty unique to the O2 because we have all of the space to play with. And I think it's something that increasingly, you know, artists are really looking to kind of think about, you know, how can they really kind of amplify, you know, the experience for their fans, you know, and, and we're working really hard with, you know, with artists, with promoters, with agents and management to ensure that happens. So Sam, we're standing outside the O2, obviously. Um, in a sense, it's one of the, uh, you know, it's a great example of urban uh, regeneration in the sense that um, it's been repurposed. I mean, it was obviously opened as the Millennium Dome. That whole tented structure has been retained and the building has been enhanced and, and, and refurbished and re-alived inside it. So, you know, in some ways, it's one of the most sustainable venues uh, in the UK, if not the world. So what work are you doing really here to, to you know, to make it less um, impactful? The building itself was built nearly 20 years ago now. So that obviously comes with lots of challenges because you can't just retrofit these old buildings in a very easy way. If you're building something from scratch, it's sometimes quite easy to kind of actually make sure it's got all those sustainable things built into it. But an older building is, it comes with its challenges. So we started a lot with the operations. Um, so we've looked at energy saving measures across the entire venue. So just last year alone, uh, the replacement of the lighting resulted in saving over 300,000 kilowatts of energy across the year, um, which is enough to power over 108 UK households. Um, we're also looking at our menus, uh, so we've done things like replacing the meat burger, the beef burger rather has been taken off the menu. Uh, we don't do any air freight for our food, and we're working with our catering partner Levy to really make sure that we're driving down those emissions across the whole menu as quickly as possible. So 
We're aiming for net zero menus, foods, food items by the end of 2025. We have recently put in a new uh, reusable cup system, um, which has gone really, really well, actually. We're very proud of how that's gone. Uh, the customer experience is so much better um, and the cups obviously are much less damaging for the environment. So much lower carbon footprint and obviously produce far less waste. Um, we've also got a new partnership with a company called Notplar, which is a seaweed-based plastic alternative. So all of our serveware now is Notplar serveware, uh, which means that it biodegrades entirely in just a couple of weeks, and we can process all of that on site with our food waste as well. So we've got a wormery and a biodigester out of house, back of house, which takes all of our food waste, and we can just process all of that on site, which takes loads of trucks off the road, minimizes all of our uh, carbon emissions, and just produces far less waste than before. So there's lots of things going on. So there's a lot of great work going on here in terms of minimizing the environmental impacts of the O2. Recently, uh, the building hosted some carbon removed events. Can you talk me through exactly what that means? Yeah, so carbon removed essentially uh, means that we are using technologies that withdraw carbon from the atmosphere in a timely and very durable way. Um, they're different from offsets because offsets generally are about preventing carbon from getting into the atmosphere or um, protecting environments like trees and building solar farms, for example, which are all really valuable things. Uh, but removals are kind of the, the true way of getting carbon right out of the atmosphere as and when you need it. So what we're doing um, is tracking all the emissions that are produced across those shows. So that's everything from the fan travel through to the merchandise sold, the food we sell, the drink, the power of the arena, obviously, the heating, pretty much everything that's going on during those events. We're tracking all of that, turning that into a carbon footprint with our friends at A Greener Future, who are our consultants who are helping us on this. And then we are paying to get all of that carbon removed from the atmosphere with our carbon removal partner, Curate. So we're sat here at the bar in the 93rd, not one of the bars in the 93rd, uh, by Qatar Airways. Um, so can you just give us a bit of a, this is a, I mean, obviously it's a beautiful premium space, um, which is, you know, very much different from a kind of uh, a box or, or a suite. It's obviously a big sort of lounge area. Um, and quite a statement, really, a £7 million project. So what's the reaction been like to it? Well, the, the reaction's been incredible. Um, you know, we've uh, sold over two-thirds of the memberships already. You know, our members are coming through and the guests are having an incredible time. Uh, we've brought up a number of promoters and agents and other partners to share them the space. And, and frankly, everybody is, is blown away. And, and yes, you're right. It was a, a statement investment, you know, over £7 million. And obviously this is a huge, I mean, seven million pound project, as we say, is, is, is a you know, beautiful space. Um, but obviously, you know, every venue has to kind of keep evolving. So what are the other evolutions, if you like, the other kind of enhancements that are in the pipeline for the, for the rest of the venue? But we're going to be making a number of uh, investments this year. You know, it's important that, you know, the O2 maintains its market leading position. We've invested heavily over the 10 years I've been at the venue, but that's only going to accelerate now. So... Uh, this year, we're investing in new 5G technology. We're upgrading all of our Wi-Fi. Um, we're installing a number of uh, just walk out um, frictionless payment uh, kiosks, you know, the kind of tap, grab and go. Uh, we're working hard behind the scenes. You know, we're investing quite heavily in the artist experience. So there's a two year program that starts this summer where we're gonna be upgrading 50% of our dressing rooms this year and another 50% of them next year. Uh, we're also focused on sustainability and we're investing quite heavily in a number of kind of projects sort of back of house with kind of earth handling units and kind of plant and machinery to ensure that the venue is operating more efficiently, driving down our energy consumption, but also driving down our carbon emissions. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on and over the next two to three years, I would only expect, you know, that um, program to accelerate. <laughs>